you very much indeed. Um, just uh, less of a caveat, more of a help me out thing. I'm currently recovering from a chest infection. Uh, if I'm going to talk for 45 minutes, my voice may start giving out. I will forget to drink some water. If I start getting croaky, someone please just go, drink. It'll be fine. You know, interrupt. It will be beneficial for all of us uh, if you do that. So yes, my name is uh, Paul Graham Raven. Um, yeah, so um, Tobias has said what I do. The, the question of how I got here may be partially relevant at least. Um, I'm a musician turned science fiction writer turned critical futurist turned infrastructure sociologist. Um, but even as a sociologist, or perhaps particularly as a sociologist, I'm first and foremost interested in stories. Um, as a writer and a critic, I'm interested in both the construction and the deconstruction of narratives. So I'm interested in making them, but I'm also very interested in taking them apart. Um, I don't believe that to be a contradiction. A lot of, um, a lot of writers are very... Uh, a very anti being a critic. There's, there's kind of that sense of um, poacher turned gamekeeper or vice versa. You know, you can, if, you, if you make the stuff, you shouldn't critique the stuff. And if you critique the stuff, you shouldn't make the stuff. I've never found it a problem. Um, it's, I just think it's worth raising that because, you know, I, I feel it gives me a, a foot in both camps, so to speak. Um, and I think possibly the the gap that's illuminated by being in both camps is in some ways, I think, the useful space that we're all trying to get at here. So hopefully that will work out. So the thing, uh, the main point I want to make is narrative as a function of language. So storytelling is something we do with words, with speech, with images, whatever, but at the end of the day, it is all fundamentally linguistic. The narrative is very similar to language in that one can use it without ever formally learning the rules. Okay, so you know we talk about people being illiterate. It's not that they can't communicate; they just can't do it in writing. You know, they understand at some sort of fundamental level how language works. They wouldn't be able to speak at all. Same applies to story. We we are surrounded by story. We speak in stories. Our politics are stories. Our society is stories. At one level, we all understand this stuff, um, but there's a difference between. You know, I guess I'm trying to get that difference between being, uh, you know, being able to speak and being literate, being able to, uh, being able to write and being able to take apart, not just knowing why something works or that it works, but trying to understand how it does what it does. And just to highlight that, so I, and this apparently is still a thing. When I was uh, uh, when I was doing my A levels, um, no, in fact, when I first went to went to be an undergrad in '94, uh, engineering course, I failed because I dropped out. Um, I remember going into the, uh, into, the, into the men's toilets one time and, uh, and just over the roll of toilet paper someone had written, media studies degree, help yourself. And that's, you know, so I, you know I laughed at the time because you, know, you were kind of supposed to. But the older I've got, the more, the more I've been kind of really sort of baffled and, and actually quite depressed about the fact that we still make these jokes about media studies. Oh God, but, you know, what are you going to do? Just going to watch TV for three years, you know? And but if you look at the world today, and especially if you look at the uh, challenging political situation we've had in this country over the last uh, few years, but more particularly the last few months, it occurs to me more than ever that if people were actually literate about how story can be used to, uh, to suggest, to seduce, to scare, to manipulate, um, maybe we wouldn't have had quite the experience that we've had. So I guess in a way this is also kind of a... Uh, not just a narrative literacy, but there's a kind of media literacy to this as well. You know, we, we all, we're all bathed in stories, but sometimes it's worth checking what's in the water. So, uh, three sections to what I'm going to talk about today. Section one, I'm going to take a, a basic look at what I call narratives of futurity, uh, to see who else tells stories about tomorrow and how they do it. Uh, in section two, uh, theory and practice, I'm going to start from the theoretical basis and move into the sort of strategic choices made in practice when you're actually putting stories together. Now, this isn't going to be specific to writing. I've tried very hard to, to generalise across. One thing to be clear, this is not high literary theory, OK? Now, I, I didn't love high literary theory. This is not the time or the place for it. It's very much, uh, it's very much an inside baseball thing. What I'm trying to do here is take what I think are the useful bits of literary theory in terms of actually doing stuff, 
and uh, sort of scrub off all the fancy terminology and, and all the academic stuff to a certain extent and give you some tools and terms with which to think about how story works, how certain effects are produced, uh, so on and so forth. And in section three, uh, ethics and reflexivity, having given you some tools to look at narrative and build narrative, uh, I want to make some points about uh, how best one should do that in the world in my humble opinion, of course. Uh, so, yeah. So, yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm a futurist. One of my hats says futurist, but I hate talking about the future. Um, the future doesn't exist. That is my problem with it. There is no the future, okay? The, the future is a plastic possibility. It's imminent. It's, it, it's not there yet. It's implicit in the present. It's impossible predict, to predict. Um, Anyone who predicts the future as a charlatan, anyone who says in the future this will happen, in the future we will do this, they probably just want some money from it. So I don't believe in the future. And I'm increasingly wary of the more sort of ambiguous term futures plural, uh, which is, you know, if you do academic futures work, that gets talked about a great deal. Unfortunately, it's a term that for me increasingly conjures up a brightly lit supermarket shelf full of new products to pick from. You know, that this sort of you know, we, okay, we've moved away from there being one future, but now, you know, here is an array of futures, and which of these would you most like to purchase? Again, money seems to be sneaking in here. Um, but it's not just science fiction authors, futurists, and designers who tell stories about tomorrow. All these things here are, in a way, stories about the future. So your stories and novels and cinema and TV, video games, adverts are stories about the future. They present an idealised person with the product in some sort of idealised life. It's a prediction, it's a suggestion, it's an invitation to step into this world. Infomercials, advertorials as well, tech journalism. Um, I don't know if you read Wired. If you read Wired 10 years ago, you wouldn't. Uh, Defence Department proposals, uh, the stuff that comes out of DARPA is pure science fiction, uh, to the extent that most science fiction authors keep a very close eye on it so they can rate it for ideas. Arms company catalogues, um, you know, technologist discourse, by which I mean uh, people, people from Silicon Valley prattling on. Uh, transhumanist propaganda, propaganda, which is also people from Silicon Valley waffling on. Speculative architecture, critical design, design fiction scenarios, manifestos, policy documents, IPO reports. These are all narratives, not of the future, but of futurity. Um, futurity is a term that I borrowed from Bruce Sterling, a uh, 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 more a less pompous way of putting it that might get the point across a little better is uh, futuriness. If you think of uh, truthiness, that, that wonderful American term, um, that's kind of what we're getting at. So, and just to emphasize the point that, you know, so these are all stories about tomorrow. Stories about tomorrow are hideously, hideously powerful things, right? Two of the most important narratives of futurity of the last 300 years, the Communist Manifesto and the Declaration of the Independence of the United States, right? Two stories about the future which have gone on to shape the world in really profound ways. Okay, so these are stories are important, stories are big, stories are powerful. And they're not just told with words, they don't always look like stories. Um, stories are not the preserve of, of you know, qualitative researchers like myself, you know, it's, it's not just a social scientist thing. Uh, the quantitative disciplines are perpetually narrating the future all the time. So you've got your, your standard profit forecast thing there. So that's a story. Uh, it's very much a story about the future because you assume that year one is obviously the year you're in. So you've got a timeline here that's saying, right, OK, well, in, in five years, this will happen. So you know, you've got a, a very, very strict delineation there, a very uh, affirmative, positivist future, um, a statement of... I mean, it's, you know, it, it's, it's implicitly speculative, but if you've ever seen someone give a, you know, a business pitch, it's never really presented as being speculative, is it? This is going to happen, right? Um, on the right, so I don't know if any of you guys from the UK got one of these. Um, I think because I live near Sheffield and, and HS2 apparently will be coming near Sheffield, I got this, uh, this wonderful leaflet about, uh, about the HS2, the, the, you know, the rail network of Britain's future. Uh, which includes the wonderful phrase uh, "classic compatible services," which is great. You know, so rather than you know, sort of, uh, it sounds like classic Coke, doesn't it? You know, just the ridiculous branding that, that you know, oh, it's okay. We'll be able to use the old trains as well, but we can't call them the old trains because that's just not suitable. 
But so, you know, this is a story of the future as well, because, you know, these lines do not yet exist. But here is this map that says, here is, here is the Britain of, well, the way we're going about 2040. But, you know, it, it, it's, it's a statement, again, it, it's an assertion that this is the way things will be. Um, it's a very old postmodernist phrase, the map is not the territory. Never been truer than this one. And uh, down the bottom, we've got some sort of, um, uh, you know, smart city brochure woo thing that I discovered on the internet. Uh, smart cities are, are classic narratives of futurity um, in, in the very sort of hard utopian mode. They are placeless places and they are timeless futures. You've got this, you know, this isn't an actual city, it's just kind of an amalgam of things that look vaguely familiar from cities you might have encountered before with some sort of big vague statements about what will be happening there, um, but we're not sure where it is, and we're not sure when it is, and there don't seem to be that many, seem to be that many people in there either. But nonetheless, it's, you know, the smart city, specific smart cities are a story about the future, but smart cities as a category are also a story about the future. They're all presented as fact, but these are all fictions, okay? The, the tools of speculation, extrapolation, and world building are used almost everywhere. They've been used in all of these, okay? They're not... They're not just something I play with when I'm doing science fiction. As such, the basic rules of narrative are portable over all these forms. So everything I'm going to talk about today can be applied to this sort of stuff. Okay? It may not be, uh, it may not be quite as easy. Uh, the, the mapping, if you like, the terms may not be quite so clear. Um, obviously, you know, my home medium, if you like, is prose. Um, those of you experienced in other media should trust the fact that you know your medium better than I do, and just try and look for the, the, the shapes and interactions I'm describing in your home medium. I will try to make some connections to other media, but I'd rather, um, I'd rather give you the, the tools and let you find it yourself than, than inaccurately guide you down the wrong path. Uh, so, uh, is, is speculation a form of, of innovation? Um, so. Uh, despite the fact that I'm a sociologist, I'm actually based in the civil engineering department. Um, and if you understand the wonderful way the, the UK academic funding system works, it's essentially a fruit machine that you press the right buzz phrases in the right order, you might get some money out. And uh, innovation, it's, you know, it's great, innovation, get, get innovation in there, get the I word in, people fund that. No, no one can tell me what it actually means at all. Um, there's some, you know, so I'd argue that, you know, if you think about the financial roots of the word speculative, you know, so we're talking uh, a speculative building, which is how most of these terraced houses were built, in fact, in the Victorian era, and, and speculative in that term was, well, we'll build them and we'll see if we make some money out of it. And, of course, one speculates on the stock market. So, and as you can see, you know, the first result that came up when I googled innovation was your man there, and it's pretty obvious what he wants that innovation to do. It's all about the Benjamins, right? <laughs> And you know, so that there is a definite connection um, etymologically, if you want, in terms of language between uh, the entrepreneurial fetish, which again is a massive thing in the academy and sadly in our government as well, you know, with with the I word innovation. But what what is innovation anyway? I mean, you know, the dictionary definition is you know the, the creating of new things. But if you actually if you read the academic literature on, on innovation studies, and if you read most of the stuff our government puts out. Innovation is basically something entrepreneurs might do after you've showered them with concessional tax rates. Um, my argument would be that, so this, this here, you know, so that there's um, uh, Jugad is, a, is I think, a, is it a Hindu word? I'm, I'm not sure, I'm not sure of, of the linguistic stuff, and apologies to anyone, but not really, I, I should know that better. But it's a term uh, mostly from the Indian subcontinent that, that is applied to what we would think of as hacks or pledges, right? It, it's sort of like, you need a thing, you can't afford, an off-the-shelf solution, you look around, you get all A-team on it, you find what you've got, you build something. As far as I'm concerned, that's as much innovation as anything this guy's going to think up. At the end of the day, innovation is about getting things done. It doesn't have to be about selling something. I if it was about selling something, but we seem to have possibly put the focus too far over that way. So a colleague of mine, Scott Smith, um, uh, another futurist, he calls his agency Changist, and I think that he totally nails their um, you know, the relationship I have with the whole you know, ideas about you know, the future and innovation and stuff. The, the future is just the accumulation of change. Uh, it doesn't matter whether it happens in a startup hub or a shack in a favela or a pub in Sheffield or wherever. It's all just 
change. It's all just people doing stuff all the time. Right? Not necessarily some guy with a suit, not necessarily some guy with a title. It's just people doing stuff all the time. Solving problems, getting shit done. And for me, storytelling and innovation, it's all just the imagination at work. Um, let's just say others would... Others might say differently, but for me, that's, you know, storytelling, innovation, design, it's all just using that. And, you know, to make a bold statement, narrative is the operating system of culture, and I've already hinted at this. You know, everything, almost every social act we do is in some way an act of storytelling. Um, almost every, you know, every way we communicate, almost everything we create is in some way telling stories, whether about the past or the present or the future. If you can learn how narrative works, you can build better stories and you can do a better job of taking other people's stories apart. And that's what I'm going to try to show you how to do. So, uh, yeah, so let's get into the theory and practice. Um, so, you know, sort of two subsections in here. I'm going to start with... Uh, what I'm calling the fish tank model of narrative, because I wanted to take all the fancy academic words out and I needed uh, a sort of off-the-shelf model to work with, and, and fish tanks turned out to be it. Uh, so once I've looked at that, um, you know, so there's three main elements to the model of narrative, world, plot, and narrator. Once I've gone through them, the second section moves into actual narrative strategies. So once I've given you the basic components, we can look at how they interact and how you actually use them or how other people might have used them, and you, know, you start getting into the effects that different combinations of these things have. Um, sadly, this isn't a how-to. I can't, you know, for one thing, I mean, if there's one thing you could take away from today, it's that storytelling is not a procedural thing, right? It's, it's an artistic practice. Most of you, I'm assuming, have some sort of background in design. That's not going to be too scary for you. Um, but, you know, it, it, I can't just, you know, there is no... A to B route in getting it right. It's very much about picking up the tools, learning by doing. Um, so when I did my masters, which was in uh, creative writing at Middlesex, uh, yeah, I, one becomes aware in in, uh, in 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 the if you do a masters in writing, you encounter the great debate over the question: Can can writing be taught? Is it possible to teach someone how to write? Or you know the, the implication being, or is it something that they just kind of learn by osmosis? And you know the, the implicit thing there as well is you know do we need to be wasting money on amazing creative writing? And so having gone through it and thought about it a lot, I'm not sure that writing can be taught. I don't think anyone could sit you down and, and just teach you how to be a good writer. What I think you can teach is, uh, for one thing, an understanding of the breadth and variety of stories that there are, and a fascination and interest. You know, I, I think once you've been shown how it's, it's like getting someone interested, you know, someone who's interested in cars and interested in mechanics. If you, if you lift the bonnet up and show them how the engine works, you've got a pretty good chance of getting people engaged with what's under the hood, and, and maybe they'll go on to start tweaking their own cars, making new ones. So no, I can't teach you to write, I can't teach you how to tell stories, but I can teach you how story works so you can learn for yourselves, I hope. So, the fish tank model of narrative. Uh, yeah, so as I say, three main elements, world, plot, and narrator. And we might as well start big, so we will start with the world. Every story has a setting, right? It doesn't matter, you know, it doesn't matter, even if you have to define that a story happens in outer space, millions and millions of, of light years away from everything, still a setting, right? Stories are placed, stories are situated. But story worlds are also four-dimensional spaces. Right, so if you think of a cube, a cube is a 3D space, but one of the easiest ways I've found of making the, the, the leap there is to say, well, you know, if a cube is a 3D space, a fish tank is a four-dimensional space. So, <coughs> you didn't remind me about drinking, did you? Good, good. A little faster next time, but good, you're learning. Yeah, so, a fish tank is a model for four-dimensional space, which is the three dimensions of space that we think of, length, breadth, and depth. Uh, but also with time, so you know, the contents of that 3D space moves around and changes uh, over time. So a fish tank is, is likewise, it's a 3D space, its inhabitants have a certain degree of agency, 
Uh, you know, they can move around and do stuff in there. It has an, it has an environment. It also has externalities. Um, you know, so if, if you if you think of uh, you know compare a fish tank to the world, there's you know that's kind of like the Earth in space. There's there's you know it's largely enclosed, but there's a certain amount of interchange with something beyond. A fish tank has a landscape, it has an economics, or it has a metabolism, but kind of passes as the same thing. It has characters, it has social dynamics. So your story world is the four-dimensional space or spaces within which the plot or plots play out. So a plot is nice and easy to define because a plot is a sequence of events that take place within the story world. Just a sequence of events. Movements, interactions, dynamics, whatever. A plot is literally just a bullet list. Or at least that's how I like mine. It's, it's less a story than a synopsis or a history of something that hasn't happened. It's, it's just a list. It's not a, you know, a plot is not a narrative. And I will get to the difference in a moment. So a plot is a sequence of events. But, uh, you know, so, so here we go. But, you know, here's, here's Mike the fish, and you know, so maybe he swims down here and eats some stuff for a while, and then he sort of pops over there to, to you know, that way they kind of float by the filter for a bit, looking a bit confused. And, you know, so it's, you know, so there's a plot, you know, Mike's Mike's journey through the fish tank. There, I don't know why he's called Mike. He's not called Mike in my notes. Um, you know, so, so there's your sequence of events. Now, a narrative is a subjective account of some or all of the events in a plot. The point here is that narrative necessitates a narrator. Someone has to tell the story. Okay? The plot is just a bunch of events until someone tells you how they saw it. Really, really important point. So, we need a narrator then. So here's Bob, and he is called Bob in my notes. I don't know whether they're both male. That's appalling of me. Um, and here's Bob, and he's making a documentary about, uh, about his fish tank here. So... Another important point to take away is that narration is equivalent to curation. Okay, and this, I cannot emphasize this enough. Narrative is curation. Bob's choices about where to point the camera, when to press record, what he does in the editing suite, all of those shape what is and isn't said about what's happened. So the bits of the plot that you actually get told about and the bits that aren't, the bits that are left behind, the bits that are overlooked for whatever reason. That's the difference between narrative and plot. Plot is what happens. Narrative is how someone experienced what happens. Very important distinction. And so, you know, so, so in this case, you know, Bob's filming his fish tank, and that's fine because you know his fish have agency, but they're not, you know, they're not astonishingly complex creatures. Fish, no offence to fish, but you know, they, they just kind of swim around and do their fish thing. So what we have here is a model of of, uh, of, of non-fiction doc documentary. Narrative, okay, so you know, like a film documentary, but you could do, you know, all the new journalism kind of work that way. You're just, you know, Bob's just seeing what goes on, reporting what goes on. He's curating that a bit. You know, he's 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 picking what goes in and what goes out. He's taking out the boring bits, presumably. But you know, those the choices about which parts of the plot we see happen here. So fiction, uh, well, no, no, that's that's no sec. So. Before moving on to the problems of fiction, so we, we can make this a bit more complex. Let's imagine that instead of, instead of a fish tank, we've got a human tank. Okay, we've got a, I don't know, maybe, you know, maybe it's a, a block of flats or a whole city or, or whatever. You know, another three-dimensional space with people in it, doing people things as they do. And, you know, Bob's still making a documentary. So there's, all of a sudden, there's a subjectivity of experience. Um, I think with the best will in the world, we can't assume fish to have a very, very great grasp of, of narrative or, or, frankly, anything else. But all of a sudden, if you've got, you know, if your agents in the world there are people uh, and you're following the actions of some or all of them, all of a sudden you've got a subjectivity coming in, a subjectivity of experience, a subjectivity of narrative. Who is speaking and who are they speaking about? So, you know, if Bob's making a film about this block of flats there, it's, you know, he's, again, he's picking which residents of the block of flats to follow, he's picking which bits of their conversation are interesting and which bits aren't, so you're getting this filtration, but of course, what he's seeing is being filtered by the people he's following, 
you know, because there's certain things that they don't consider interesting enough to tell you, but there's some things they consider very interesting that they want to tell you. There's some things that they do all the time, which might to you look quite novel, but to them are quite banal, and vice versa. So there are two levels of subjectivity straight away. And this is just documentary non-fiction. Um, but you can see how, in this sense, non-fiction does not mean non-story. It does not mean non-narrative, okay? Non-fiction is a narrative too. Um, so next time you watch a documentary, it, 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 it's sit down and think about, uh, you know, so, so while, you, while you're watching what you get to see, think about what you didn't get to see. Think about where the cuts in the interviews happened. Think about the choices of who to in interview and who not to interview happened. So, you know, non-fiction is a story as well. It is a narrative. It is not... It is not the whole truth, nor is it nothing but the truth. But fiction is even, even more complicated. So if we replace the fish tank with an entirely imagined world, so this isn't a real block of flats anymore, this is, I don't know, you know, whatever, a generation starship, whatever you want it to be. If that's an imagined world, um, so, you know, Bob is still curating your guided tour of this space, but it's a, it's a space that he or someone else has made up. So you're getting a guided tour, which is subjective, of a bunch of subjective experiences of an invented space whose invention and parameters are, of course, a function of subjectivity of the person who made it up. Which all sounds a bit confusing, and, and it can be at times. Um, and it's also worth bearing in mind that, that Bob here, the narrator, he might actually be invented as well. You see, I might be the narrator outside of that imaginary world. I could be narrating Bob as he narrates what happens. In the... So, you know, when people talk about narrative frames, this is kind of what they're on about. But we're going to get into that a bit more in a little bit. Um, so, uh, da -da -da -da, where am I? Yeah, no, I think I've nailed that one. You're looking quite confused, and that's usually the right effect for this point. <laughs> so, we've got our three basic elements. Let's see... Uh, if we can actually work out how to combine these, how to use these to make different sorts of stories, uh, to tell, uh, to show different things, to produce different effects. So we're going to start off talking about character and point of view. Um, I kind of started getting at this when I was talking about Bob. Um, the big difference with fiction, with made-up stories compared to the documentary form, is that the narrator is almost, almost always actually inside the tank, not outside. So in fiction, the narrator is, is a fictional character as well, even though it's you writing them, because it's not actually you writing as you, it's you writing as someone else. So your choice of narrator or narrators influences what can and can't be narrated. What has your narrator seen? What have they understood? What have they not understood? What second-hand knowledge have they got from someone else? How good is that second-hand knowledge? So, uh, imagine, so imagine you've got a story of, uh, you know, sort of a complex plot of political intrigue. Uh, perhaps there's a scene in a palace ballroom where something really dynamic happens. Uh, how different would that scene look from the point of view of you know, the king's right-hand man compared to the point of view of his five-year-old daughter? Right? Same scene, the same events. Very, very different perception. The things that those two different people would look for and take home as important would be completely different. They're still describing the same thing. And so, um, you know, and as a kind of sideline here, something I do in my practice a lot, and I know other writers do as well, when you're working on stories, when you're working on scenes, um, even if you only need one point of view and perspective on a scene, Try and write a whole bunch of them. If there, if there are multiple viewpoint characters possible in a scene, sketch out as many of them as possible. Um, this, for one thing, it makes you think more about uh, the kind of dark matter of the scene, you know, the, the bits that the one viewpoint character would have overlooked. And in some way, it, you know, it can't make them more real, but it makes them feel more real. If you have that, uh, that sense of depth, that, that sense of there being a whole lot of stuff um, Hemingway, who is a very famous and notable writer whose work I actually can't stand, uh, once made a really great statement about this. He, he talked about, uh, I 
can't remember the exact phrasing, but he, he said something about you know the dignity of the dignity of an iceberg's movement in the sea. Is that, you know that that dignity and grace comes from the fact that you only see the top ten percent of the iceberg. You don't see the huge mass of stuff beneath. And so the point is, if you've done enough work here, if you've if the scene is detailed enough here, it doesn't matter which angle you write it from, you will write it with confidence and you will write it in ways that imply the bits, you know, it, it, you, story tells more than the words on the page. And the more you understand the scene, the more you've looked at it from multiple perspectives, the more that sense of depth comes through. So, ways of narrating, particularly with prose. So you have a choice of how, you know, which, which modes and styles you're going to narrate in. I'm going to start with what we call the third person omniscient. Now, the third person is, is so if I say, uh, uh, you know, Jenny, walked out of, you know, Jenny walks out of her hotel, she goes to the lobby and checks out, uh, she turns right outside the door, pops into a coffee shop. Th this is a third person narrative because uh, I'm describing something that someone else is doing but I'm not doing it necessarily from my perspective, I'm doing it from a kind of God's eye view. Um, a lot of narrative, the vast majority of narrative probably, is third person, especially once you get outside of literature. But third person omniscient is quite particular and distinct. It's the whole point of omniscient is the narrator knows everything, or at least gives the impression of knowing everything about the world they're describing. This is the closest we get to the original fish tank model. This is the closest we get to being Bob, right? Because he can see anywhere at any time in that fish tank. Good call, you see? Um, you know, so, so, you know, a, a third person on this narrator can talk about any character in the world, any place in the world. The omniscient narrator can see everything they want to, anywhere, anytime. And most importantly, the third person on this narrator uh, has access to what I call interiority. The third person on this narrator can access and narrate the thoughts and motivations of the characters they're following. Uh, and as such, because the narrator can see everyone's thoughts if they want to, uh, there's a sense that they are therefore kind of neutral, kind of a, an uninvolved onlooker. It's just Bob with his camera. Just, he's just watching the fish tank, right? But can a curator ever be neutral or uninvolved, really? Don't have an answer for that one. It's just a thought I want to leave you with. Um, the third person on this end is therefore very powerful, but it provides a false sense of omniscience in the reader. Uh, that can be useful, but it can be abused as well. By when we do third person omniscient narrating, when we give the impression that we can access everyone's motivations, everyone's thoughts, see everywhere, know everything, we give the reader the impression that not only can we do that, but they can as well. I don't think it's true. Um, so the third person on this end used to be a lot more popular in fiction than it is now. That might be one of the reasons for it. But what has become much more commonplace is what we call the third person limited. Now, in this case, the narrator is still outside the tank. The narrator, the person, the voice telling the story is not one of the characters. You know, that you know, they are not a personality themselves. They are, you know, the, the narration is happening outside of the fish tank. But third person limited fo follows one or more specific focal characters and ignores the others. So the limited is, is in comparison to the omniscient. The omniscient can access the thoughts and motivations of any of the characters in the world, but the third person limited can only follow uh, one character at a time. So uh, the god's eye view is swapped for a kind of imp on the shoulder view, if you like. If you imagine a, uh, a little imp you know, either on the shoulder or who actually lives in the character's head, and they can't control them, but you know, they're kind of just sort of sat in there and they can see what the character sees and they can hear the character thinking. Uh, and this, this, this focuses the narrative on this one character or one character at a time, certainly, only accesses their interiority. Uh, that means the thoughts and motivations of other characters must be inferred by the character that you're following. Okay, so all of a sudden you've got that subjectivity back, but you've got it at a much more experiential level. So if your viewpoint character is, is 
wandering around and they bump into someone who isn't a viewpoint character, that other character does or says something. Um, unless the character whose perspective you're looking from has some sort of reason to know the motivations of the other character being described, you can't, as a narrator, tell the reader what that person is thinking. You can infer it, and there are all sorts of ways of playing around with it. A lot, you know, a lot, of, the, a lot of the skill of the person that it comes from working ways around the limitations that you've set on yourself. Because you need to be able to get plot elements across, and especially you know, think about you know, thriller plots or crime plots in particular. And they're almost always third person limited because the whole point is it's the detective with a mystery to solve. With the omniscient mode, there's no mystery. Because you know, the omniscient narrator can just say, who done it? Oh, that guy. Third person limited, you're, you're, it's just one person trying to work a thing out and you don't get to find it out before they do. That's the important thing of the third person limited. You are keeping the reader not in the dark, but you are limiting their ability to guess outside of their experience. It means basically you have a much more, hang on a sec, you have a, you have a much tighter control on the flow of information to the reader. So like the minority report, the example of that? Say again? The minority report, the example of that? Uh, I wish I could say I've seen enough of the film to say so. Okay. Um, cinema is generally... Yeah, so cinema is a tricky one. I mean, it's kind of... I think if I understand the, the plot of the original novel fairly well, yes and no. I, I, will get on to, I will get on to the difference there, because cinema, because of the way it works, cinema can't do interiority. I, I will come to this point shortly. That's a good one to raise. So, with the third person limited, the choice of focal character, the character that you choose to follow and the character whose experience you choose to narrate, therefore shapes what can be shown and what can be known what, you know, to the reader. This is why it's popular for novels, because it, angles, it anchors the story to characters. Uh, characters are what interest people as readers, it's, what we get, uh, it's how we generate sympathy, it's how we generate interest. Uh, but the third person limited can be very, very hard work. It takes a lot of control to stick to those limits uh, and still work around them. It, it's, you know, all, I think all art is fundamentally born out of constraint, not freedom, but it's, you know, the knack of setting, setting limits on yourself and then working out how to exceed them anyway. So, you know the second person. Uh, you recall early computer games and pick your own adventure books that addressed you as you, conflating your identity with the action on the page. You may well remember the effect with fondness, but you're also aware that you don't encounter it outside of those media very often. You've heard it said that it's useless for serious fiction writing, but you're not so sure because those Charlie Strauss novels did something fairly all right with it, actually. In fact, you've wondered ever since whether the second person might be due its way in the sunshine precisely because of the ubiquity of computer gaming, and you'd like to try more experiments with it for that reason. But you also worry that it's clunky and awkward and it makes you sound a bit mad. You're not sure what to do with it, in fact, but you decided to keep it in for the sake of completeness. So, I'm trying to demonstrate that you know, the, the second person, it, it's a very weird form to read, and there are a couple of really great novels by Charlie Strauss which do it really, really well. But it really does, you know, the, the, particularly you know, the first 50 pages are baffling because you're not used to text addressing you as you and especially not when it's addressing you as you and telling you what you're doing as a character who you are not um, and when it's done well it can really work if, if you get the identification there you know that there is a the second person is, is kind of a hollow a hollow narration you're inviting the reader to very much step into there and, and be the person who's being narrated so there is, there is a power there, but again, there's a limit to it. Um, if you start, if you invite the reader to inhabit this second person narration, and you then start narrating them doing stuff they wouldn't feel they would do in that circumstance, you, start, you push them out, you break the illusion. So, there's, you know, it, it's, it, you know, like I say, it doesn't get used enough, and it doesn't get used very much. I, I think there may be, I think if anything, you know, strategic critical design may be one of the places that people could do more with the second person narrative. But it is not an easy trick to pull. So, the first person. So, now I'm the narrator. 
me, the focal character in the first person narrative, it all comes straight from the horse's mouth. I'll tell it how I see it or saw it and that's all you'll get. Uh, I may well tell you my thoughts as well as my actions and observations, but I'm not advised to do so. I'll tell you as much as I feel I want to know, as, as much as I feel I want you to know, and no more. But I'm capable of lying to, to you, and to sometimes myself as well. And who knows what I might choose not to tell you. The omission of truth isn't lying, after all, but it still muddies the waters. The upside is immediacy. You get to feel that you know me intimately, like I'm talking directly to you, and you understand instinctively the limits of what I can know about my world. Problem is, I might not be likable or sympathetic to every reader, and I can't tell you what I don't know. So, again, just trying to demonstrate that the first person uh, speaks with the pronoun I. I did this, I am doing that. The first person, therefore, really foregrounds subjectivity, because you're kind of, you know, so with the first person, Bob is inside the fish tank, okay, he's in the action, and therefore he doesn't have that God's eye view anymore, in theory, I mean, there are ways around that, and uh, science fiction plays with that trick quite a lot, so you have, you really foreground the subjectivity, you foreground the problems of what can be known and what can't to an individual, in doing so, you sacrifice a massive amount of bandwidth as concerns the, uh, the story world. If you're limiting your perspective to, you know, if you go back to, was it Mike? Was, it, was the fish called Mike? I can't remember, I think it was Mike. If you go back to Mike, a first person narrative of Mike the fish, you can only see the bits of the tank that Mike goes to. And maybe he just likes to hang out in that corner by the pump like we were talking about. So the first person has that power of really, it's, in some ways it's a much more honest way to narrate a world but it is a much more restricted way at the same time. So there's another narrator who we've kind of been talking about all along, and this is the Bob problem. So, you know, the implicit narrator. So the first and second person narrators are inside the fish tank. The third person narrator kind of pretends they're not in the fish tank. Um, you know, the, the action and characters that they're talking about are inside the tank, but the omniscience and third person perspective suggests that outside the back, outside the tank view. But in fact, in all cases, absolutely every case, including documentary, as we talked about earlier, the true narrator is always outside the tank because the true or implicit narrator is you, the author, the designer, the whatever it is you're doing. No matter the choice of voice or point of view or character, you are Bob filming that fish tank. You are the god of the fish tank and everything in that fish tank, because remember the fish tank is imaginary when making this stuff up, Everything is under your control. The point being, for all the talk about what characters think and feel, you create the narrative. As such, they will always speak to some extent with your voice. They will always, to some extent, embody your choice. We'll come back to this point. Yeah, tense and temporality. If, if point of view and character, which we've just been talking about, if that's about where in the world the action takes place, Tense is about when it happened in relation to the telling of the tale. So, uh, the future tense, you know, it, you know, like I was saying earlier, when, when, when people say, oh, in 20 years' time, uh, we will have uh, maglev trains all over Britain. Um, when, when Brexit happens, we'll negotiate really successfully with the EU. Right? These are both future tense statements. They're very, very rare in fiction. It's, it's pretty much something you only use for stunt effect because, well, I'm not entirely sure why, but the fact that the future tense is the default narrative mode of religion, prophecy, politics, and advertising implies uh, you know, that there is, a, there is an implication of certainty or inevitability in a future tense narrative that the invent, you know, that if you, if you narrate in the future tense, you are, you are claiming that the events in description will happen, in fact must happen. And it may be that closeness to religion and prophecy and politics that means it's unpopular in, in literary forms now. It's, it's something you pretty much only use as a way of kind of undermining its own premise. But don't discount the rhetorical power of a strong narrative in the future tense. I mean, you know, the, the last month has been a really, really good example of that. The funny thing about future tense narratives, if, if you just write them down, if someone writes them down and you read them, they seem ridiculous. But it turns out that when a guy with a really good cut glass Oxbridge accent and a nice suit stands up and says one in Westminster, an awful lot of people will buy it hook, line and sinker. Okay, so especially, and I think this is worth 
remembering for designers, you know, the future tense is pretty much useless for, for writers of fiction, but for, uh, for designers and people messing around in those sort of, uh, in different narrative spaces, especially in material narrative spaces, the future tense is much more interesting because you can, you can play with that without necessarily revealing exactly what it is you're trying to do. So basically, if the narrator, with the future tense, if you get the right narrator, and if the medium you're using suits the message you're trying to get across, the future tense can sell literally the world. So the present tense is still fairly rare in literature, at least it is these days. It used to be a lot more popular in Victorian era, a lot of present tense stuff then. Uh, the present tense is a story being told in the process of its unfolding. Right, so uh, a present tense narrative um, in the first person would be, you know, um, I'm going down the stairs and I'm walking into the lobby. As I walk up to the desk, the woman behind the desk looks up and says, we have a message for you, Mr. Raven. You know, so this is a present tense. You know, there's no sense that the events have already happened and I'm telling you about it later. It's like you're kind of following me along and I'm just kind of talking to myself and you're picking it up. So it's a story being told in the process of its own unfolding. That means it has a real sort of immediacy. There's a real sense that you're kind of right there and stuff is happening and it's all, uh, you know, that emphasises the uncertainty, I think, of the future, the present tense. Um, precisely because there is no sense that you, you have no, for one thing, you have no hindsight and you have no foresight either. The present tense literally cap captures you or, or, or the character you're narrating in the moment and therefore the reader is held in the moment as well. And as such, outcomes are held in the balance. What makes the present tense tricky for fiction, again, might make it very useful for, uh, for doing design work. Uncertain futures quite possibly warrant uncertain narrators. I think that's quite an important part, uh, quite an important part to make. Uh, when, when you're writing a novel, you're trying to make rhetorical points on a grand scale. If I've understood what strategic and creative design tries to do, is it's more about making similar rhetorical statements but at a smaller scale, at a much more human scale. We're not talking about the big problems of society. We're trying to sort of go for that focus where the rubber hits the road, if you like. So, yeah, uncertain futures may warrant uncertain narrators, and the present tense is very useful for that. But it really is hard work to do it in prose. It takes a lot of work. Um, it's much more at home in visual media, um, in which everything is narrated as if in the present, because you're seeing it. Right? I mean, you know, so narrative on the page can, can have any temporality, but visual, you know, vision sight is, is very immediate because it's, it's, it's our dominant sense, it's how we understand what we're doing in the world when we're doing it. So therefore, cinema is always kind of in the present tense and it has to signal its temporality uh, using framing devices. So uh, for example, you, know, you might have a thing that says 10 years later comes up underneath or, or you might, uh, there might be diegetic clues, so you, know, you might have the actors sort of made up to look older or, and dressed in different clothes to hint, at that, to hint at that difference in time. But otherwise it's very, very hard to do, uh, very hard to do that sort of temporality with, uh, with cinema. Uh, and as such, present tense cinematic stuff, something of an overlap. And, you know, it's a good thing he's on the ball, isn't it, really? Probably have a voice We all have our cross to bear. Can I ask a quick question? Mm, sure. So they gave us a sort of specific definition of diegetic yesterday, but I'd like to know what the difference between that and uh, So in, I'm using it in the David Kirby sense, but more broadly, the easiest way to get at the definition is in terms of soundtracks. So in the soundtrack to a movie, the diegetic sounds are the sounds in that scene that are caused by things you can see happening in the scene. So if there's a scene set in a restaurant and you can hear cutlery clanking, that's a diegetic sound. It's happening in what you're seeing. But if there's sort of melancholic string music in the background that isn't coming out of the jukebox, that's not diegetic. So diegetic is what is in the scene you can see. The opposite of diegetic in that term is mimetic. So it's mimetic sounds, the sounds that are only for us as the audience, as well as diegetic sounds for the characters at the audience. Yeah, it's interesting to think about that in the context of what a diegetic prototype is and should do and how that should work. Are there a prototypes? Well, that would be stuff in this room. 
It, it, in a way, that's exactly what I'm teaching to do. <laughs> or trying to, anyway. Um, so, yeah, after the present tense, the past tense, uh, which is by far the most common tense for prose fiction, as I already hinted. It's the easiest to work with in some respect because the past tense means you can slice up the timeline however you want, which makes hiding and revealing things much easier. It's also the easiest for people to read in, in prose because it is so familiar. Almost all, almost all of our discourse is written in the past tense. If you read newspaper columns, if you, uh, pretty much anything like that, we, you know, we, we talk, you know, it may not be the distant past, but we talk about things that have happened a lot more than we talk about things that are happening or will happen. And as the, uh, as the science fiction critic John Clute says, the past tense has one important rhetorical effect. The past tense implies that the person telling the story survives to the end. Now, as a science fiction critic, John Clute knows that's exactly the sort of expectation that SF is really, really good at screwing with. But, you know, so, but, but, you know and it's worth bearing in mind these, these sort of deep structural things, you, you know, that there is a deep implication there. If you tell a story in the past tense, the person telling the story is assumed to have survived the events that they're describing. So that gets you past the contrast to the uncertainty of the present tense. So a narration in the present tense, that person narrating could theoretically die at any point, or, or anything else could happen. But in the past tense, if they're telling you the story as a, you know, as a history of themselves, they must have survived to tell you it, right? So there's a solidity, a certainty, to the past tense, the events are historical, they're a little distanced, as such they're perhaps a little easier for the narrator to contextualise in the broader sense of the world in which they live. There's room for hindsight, reflection, regret, the path's not taken. So I'm going to briefly talk about worlds again, just a, just a quick point here. So a term of art from science fiction criticism, uh, primary worlds and secondary worlds. Uh, this, this comes out of the problems of temporality that science fiction has in particular. Uh, a primary world is a world which is contiguous somehow, however distantly, with the reality that you as a reader are familiar with. So, you know, basically, a prim primary world fiction is written in some version of, you know, not necessarily Earth, but some future human existence which, at some point, you can draw a line back to where we are today. Whereas a secondary world is discontinuous. It's, you know, so if, you, you know, if you're familiar with you know, space opera, uh, stuff like Star Wars, planetary romance, you know, this is all, you know, they're recognizably human-like people, but the whole point is that you can't, that you can't get there from here. There's no implication that, you know, that, that we kind of gradually got there. So you're, you know, the prim a primary, primary world fiction draws on the world the reader knows. Secondary world, world fiction just kind of scrubs the slates clean and starts from scratch. So design in particular, and, and critical design in particular, it strikes me that it's probably almost always going to use primary worlds because you know, the, you know, the whole point is we're trying to talk about the world we live in. But, I don't know, maybe there could be some uses for, for secondary worlds. It does mean a lot more world building, but as, you know, as, as things like Star Wars demonstrate, secondary world fictions are very, very powerful. And there's, there's something to do with... They're powerful because the, the unrealness of them means that we can project into them much more easily. When, when a world is coherent but also obviously unreal to us, there's a weird psychological effect where we start trying to say, well, if it can't be anywhere, it must be everywhere. Um, these used to be referred to as psychomyths. So it's somewhere, even, somewhere in between primary world and secondary world. These, you know, a psychomyth is a world where it isn't really anywhere or any when, but because you know, it, it, it's a place where you kind of put fables and you, you kind of try and make grander statements about uh, about human society, precisely because it's nowhere. Because the only thing you have to latch onto in in this in this nowhere space, in this unreal space, the only thing you have to latch onto is the characters, and so it becomes very much all about the characters. So there is a power to it. What do you mean the name of the uh, psychos? Psychomyths. 
Yeah, that's a, that's a really old term, and I only actually encountered that. I was rereading um, a book of Ursula Le Guin's early short stories. And uh, back in those days, they used to get authors to actually do a little sort of intro to each story. And there's a term she uses there, and I think it's largely fallen out of favour. Um, but it was so it was so much the right thing for what I wanted to describe to you, I thought I'd pick it up and use it again, because I haven't found anything to replace it. So that connects us quite neatly to the question of utopia and dystopia. So um, I could and have spoken at much greater length about utopia and dystopia, um, but it's very hard to do that without getting into theory. The important thing to bear in mind is the, the literal transla translation of the term utopia uh, is ambiguous. It's, it's a Greek term, but because of, the, uh, because of homo a homophony in Greek, uh, utopia could mean either good place or no place. And so uh, utopias and dystopias are psychomyths in that they are the very fact that they are not recognisably anywhere that we know means that they become a screen onto which we can project all our expectations of places. You know, in a way it's a cleaning, it's a, it's, again, it's a cleaning, it's a blanking of the slate which enables you to put people much more in the foreground. But however, you don't have the coherency and depth of world building that comes with it. But so, utopia and dystopia is very much something that boils down to the implicit narrator, which is you. So, when you're, when you're developing a future, when you're developing a narrative of futurity, you need, to decide, you need to decide, do you want it to seduce people, do you want it to scare people, are you trying to sell the future, are you trying to warn people about the future, are you trying to critique the future that you think is coming? Uh, and some of the stuff, uh, some of what proceeds, some of what I've been talking about can help with that. Uh, your choice of character uh, really, really makes a difference, you know, which character or characters are most likely to see the world in the way that you want your reader to see the world. It's really confusing, all the narrative frames. That's why our writers are mad. Um, you know, so, you know, which character is most likely to relate to that world in the way that you want the reader to relate to it? You're, you're very much trying to put, again, trying to put the reader in the, in the narrator's space. Um, and it's easy, it's very easy to be obvious, which is why utopia is a dirty word, dirty word and dystopia is a cliche. Um, you know, it's very, very easy to... You know, to portray a world that none of us want to live in, and it's very, very easy to portray a world that all of us would like to live in. It's, for me, the subjectivity of utopia is something that gets overlooked. So even in the original, you know, in, in the book from which Utopia takes its name, a book by Thomas More, which was written 400 years ago this year, in fact, um, if you go back and read that now, and this is where the ambiguity between no place and good place comes, so Thomas More was, uh, was a churchman, um, but he was, you know, you know Utopia describes uh, an island, you know, an imagined island community far away where the social order is completely different to that of England at the time he's writing it. And in some ways, it seems quite, it seems very utopian, by, by com certainly by comparison to the England of the time. Um, you know, there's uh, equality between men and women, for example, uh, which took a long time to happen in reality. Um, you know, it, it's, ki it's kind of proto-socialist as well. You know, if, you know, no one is no one is poor. You know, there, there, there are still there are still differences. But you know, no one, you know, everyone has access to, to land to, to grow their food or what have you. But at the same time, um, there are aspects of Moore's utopia which would seem fairly dystopian. Um, and one modern example of that is. Uh, in Moore's Utopia, the punishment for adultery was hanging. Um, and I don't think we'd, we'd like that to come back. So, the point is that one person's utopia could be another person's dystopia. Um, and again, going back to Silicon Valley, we're kind of seeing that right now. The world they want to build for us is, is increasingly, I think, not the world we want them to build for us. So what looks like a utopia to them is increasingly like, like, like a dystopia to us. And there are also different modes of writing the utopia. You can just do the sort of, here's a wonderful future, wouldn't this be great? But you can also do what is called the critical utopia, uh, which um, is described by uh, Edward James uh, as utopias which are shown in the process of their own inevitable failure. So the critical utopia critiques not just 
the utopia it presents, but the possibility of utopia itself. So this is kind of the backlot work. You know, when you're thinking about the utopian or dystopian aspects of, of, your, of your material, you're kind of sat in the director's chair. We're almost one step back from, from Bob again. Um, you know, it's, it's, you know it, it's, easy, it's easy to be obvious, like I say, but it is, not, oh, it is never particularly easy to not be obvious. But it's exactly by not being obvious that you get to the powerful stuff. So I would suggest that when thinking about the utopian, dystopian axis, try and avoid extremes, try and avoid running to one end or the other. Partly because they've all been done to death, but partly because the interesting subjectivities are always in that centre ground, right? They're always in the place where everyone's like, well, you know, I think broadly we're in, agree in agreement on 75% of this stuff, but there's 25% here we're really fucking angry about, and we're back to Brexit again, okay? But, but the, that ambivalence, the, the conflict, the subjectivity, the point at which a utopia becomes a dystopia for someone, that is where the interesting stuff happens, I think. And that, it has always seemed to me, is what strategic and critical design is, trying, in, is interested in, in getting at. It's not, it's not about making universal statements, it's about getting at that point where the experience flips. Um, so yeah, as I mentioned earlier, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a writer for, first and foremost. Um, it uh, goes without saying that every medium is different, um, but there are general uh, narrative truths which cut across the, uh, cut across the di different mediums. Drink. Yeah, preemptive, you know. Amateur, rather. Amateur. Um, yeah, every medium is different. Uh, I know prose. I can tell you an awful lot about how to fiddle with prose. Um, if you want to talk about other media, you should really ask an expert. Um, but I can talk about uh, rhetorical biases, I suppose we might call it, and we're, we're kind of back to the point here with cinema. So, as uh, cinema is an inherently spectacular medium. Again, it's, it's visual, it's immediate, it's kind of the present tense by default. And therefore, the way in which cinema tells stories is, is different. And you know, we could probably get a, a film studies person in here to talk to that difference for an hour, and frankly, I think we'd all be no more confused or enlightened than we are at this point. But you know, it, it, it's but as with all these things, and as I, you know, going back to the earlier point about can writing be taught, that, it doesn't really matter. You know, the, the way to work out the rhetorical biases of a medium in the terms of the thing you're trying to do is to try and do it. Um, so. I don't really have time today to talk about the work I have done on this stuff. This is, uh, this is an excerpt from it. I have, um, I have pe published papers on this. If you would like me to send you a copy, I would be delighted to do so. What's the word at the bottom? Just move, move the uh, mouse. Mm. Uh, spectacular. Actually, in more recent versions of this model, that has been changed for melodramatic. And that's actually probably a point worth making quickly. Um, so yeah, if you'll notice here, we've got the diegetic and mimetic axis, which we kind of touched on earlier. And again, I could go into this, but it would take an extra half an hour that we don't have. Um, but the, so the, the, the uh, distinction between dramatic and spectacular or melodramatic is, is probably one of the best ways of getting at the distinction between prose and cinema. Um, it's not to say that you can't do spectacular melodrama with prose, and it's certainly not to say that you can't do drama with cinema. But because of the biases of the medium, it's much, much harder to push to those edges. And as such, you're always going to be pushed. So if you're working in cinema, you're always going to be pushed into these modes to some extent. Maybe not all the way, maybe only just over here, but if you're doing visual work, it's very, very hard to stay out of here. And likewise, if you're doing diegetic work, it's very, very hard to stay out of this half. So this is kind of a way of, of thinking about, about mediums and the, and, the, and the effects you want to have. Kind of a way of thinking strategically about this. Um, it's presented more as a sort of critical framework because that's the only way I could convince them to publish the paper. Um, I would be happy to unpack it uh, in circumstances where that would be useful. Um, but yeah, so, you know, and, and think... You know, think big in terms of what 
media are available. So we've talked about prose, about written stuff. We've talked about video and cinema. We've talked about design. But bear in mind, theatre is a medium. Websites can be a medium. Websites can be great. Okay, you, you can you could theoretically make a website as an artifact that narrates a future. Um, games, as we've talked about, uh, they, you know, computer games and also uh, live action role playing uh, can be used to tell stories about the future. And uh, to some extent, interventions. You know, so, so, you guys familiar with the Yes Men? Right, so, so they're kind of, they're storytellers in a way, but they're, you know, but they're telling a story not by writing it down, but by going and, and kind of, you know, it's kind of theatre and it's kind of, it's kind of design fiction-y, but it isn't really any of them, but it's very definitely a way of telling stories about the future and very, very critical stories about the future. More to the point. So I guess the, the big takeaway here is if you've got the time, try it out. If you think it might work, give it a go. If, you know, no matter how marginal possibility happens, give it a try, because that's how people discover new things and get new ways of doing stuff. So, we're getting near the end now, you can all relax. Yeah? Um, ethics and reflexivity. Um, thinking about what you're doing, and why you're doing it, and who you're doing it for. So, a very handy quote from Francis Spufford, who I think still lectures at Goldsmiths, possibly? I think, I think he was one of Picard's tutors, or he was certainly there yeah, at the time. Was, yeah. So I, I, I know Francis Bufford as the writer of The Excellent Red Plenty, which is a novelised a novelized history of, um, of the Soviet Union's attempt to automate its economy through computers. It's an amazing book, really, really good. But he's just written his first you know, proper novel. And as, as happens when you're a famous person who writes their first proper novel, The Guardian gets in touch and asks you to write something about it, which must be nice. Um, and there was this great section here which, which really, really spoke, I thought, to, you know, to, to what I was trying to get at here. The point is that narrative is not history. So it says, but for the trouble was I discovered that narrative had needs of its own. Narrative, to harmonise, requires a harmonious development of mood. Narrative, to resolve, requires a shape that history may not obligingly provide. Narrative isn't history. It can be made out of history but it's a stylization, a refinement, a second order product. It isn't the flowing multitudinous cacophony of human experiences that constitutes the real past. So if narrative isn't history, then narratives of futurity are not future history. And as far as I'm concerned, the only sin in either of these cases is to ever pretend otherwise, to pretend that your fiction is a promise or a prophecy. Sadly, people do it all the time, as we've already mentioned. Politics is our cautionary example. Both sides in the debate that I keep not wanting to mention, but nonetheless have to, both sides on that debate tried passing off narratives of futurity as future histories, as prophecies. Both sides. And you can see what happens when that happens, right? It's dangerous. But the problem is, it's exactly in that fuzzy space between the believable product and the rhetorical prototype that design futures, design fiction is rhetorical, design, critical design, call it what you like. It's exactly in that problematic space where it kind of gets passed off as real that the interesting work happens. That's when you get inside people's heads, that's when you change minds. There is an extent to which all of this stuff is, is kind of an exploit, it's a bit of a it's kind of a troll game. You know, you're trying to screw with people's expectations. You're trying to set up expectations and overturn them. So it's a troll game, but I think, or at least I hope, on your part, it's a well-intended one. But it is dangerous. Humans are highly, highly susceptible to narrative. Well, I hope I've emphasized that point sufficiently. If you make a narrative convincing enough, it will reproduce of its own accord. It will sell and it will sell itself, even if you're not trying to sell anything. There's another quote um, out of The Guardian, so you can tell what I do when I'm not actually getting on with my thesis. Uh, this is from a chap called John Mullen, and uh, he says, Plot is not just a sequence of connected events, but something rarer, 
the unfolding of a hidden design. Plot involves the laying of clues, the implicit promise to the reader or viewer that the true significance of what we read or see is not self-evident, but will eventually be revealed. A good plot exploits not just suspense, but a kind of retrospective curiosity. This is the important bit for you guys. When we know that a story has a plot, we find ourselves asking not so much what will happen next, as what has already happened. Plot activates our confidence in design, our faith that the creator of a narrative knows what he or she is doing from the first moment. It's up to you whether you deliver on that faith or not, and why you choose to do that. So, are you familiar with the term death of the author, Roland Bart? So, for those of you who don't know, Roland Bart was a, a French structuralist critic of literature. Uh, he talked a lot about what he called the death of the author, uh, which is basically a phenomenon whereby, um, due to the mechanical reproduction of narratives and the, the fact that narratives can just sort of escape into the media world, the interpretation of a work becomes detached from the person who made it. You know, in a way, it, you know, so, so critics, uh, when we talk about when we talk about fiction in this way, we talk about the intentional fallacy, which is the fallacy that our reading of the work is the reading that the writer intended. Um, so what we have here is, is an argument about telos or purpose, you know, sort of you know, the, the act of deliberately making a piece of art to make a point versus the idea that art is for art's sake and you know, it doesn't, you know, sure you can interpret it, but it doesn't really matter. There's an extent to which artists can hide behind Bart and they can kind of disclaim responsibility for the consequences of their interpretation. Right? So if you wrote a, you know, a spectacularly angry right-wing novel that encouraged loads of people to, uh, to start a militia, um, as has happened in the States, you can just say, oh, no, no, this is just a story. I didn't, I, didn't want, I didn't want anyone to do that. It's just a story. If, if they've chosen to interpret that way, I'm not, I'm not responsible. I'm just an artist. I just write books. I just tell stories for the sake of telling stories. Um, I have, and this is the interesting and fun part of straddling that poacher gamekeeper thing as a critic and a writer, I have a massive problem. I have a massive, massive problem with the intentional fallacy. Because as a writer, I understand why writers want it. But as a critic, I know it's bullshit. And you guys doing what you're doing, you can't hide behind the intentional fallacy anyway. And this is the important bit. So we're using the tools of art here, but we're not using the tools of art for art's own sake. Strategic design and critical design has telos, it has purpose, it has aims. You're trying to do things, and you know what you're trying to do when you set out to do them. Its outputs are therefore necessarily political. Stories escape their creators. Stories reproduce on their own. Stories mutate. Stories get shorn from their context. But stories are your children, so you have to raise them right and you have to be responsible for them. You have to... You have to be willing to stand there when someone comes back and says, what did you mean to do with this? You need to have an answer. It doesn't have to be an answer they like. You don't even have to tell them the answer, but you need to have it back. And that responsibility that I'm talking about, for me at least, is a question of power and framing. It's about who speaks and who doesn't. It's about who holds power and who doesn't have it. And again, to use a term uh, that's very, very popular in, in engineering, and indeed in the sociology of engineering, and I expect you've heard it in calls for, uh, you know, calls for proposals and God knows what else, I think you know, the greatest euphemism and shibboleth of the 21st century is the word stakeholder. <laughs> Who is the stakeholder? And do you know what? Every time I hear someone say stakeholder, I think of Buffy the Vampire Slayer. And from now on, all of you are going to think that as well. But this is the point, right? Who the hell is the stakeholder? People have faces, people have names. We can't tell these stories about anonymous categories, that's the point. 
when we think about power, we don't, you know, we can't think about, okay, well, you know, the poor or the rich or the elites or whatever. I mean, sure, they're useful categories for sociologists, but if you're telling stories, you have to put faces on these people. Institutions can't, institutions have no agency. Ideas have no agency. Britain has no agency. Britain can't do anything. When, you know, again, back to between Brexit again, you know, you, as they, you've seen countless times in the newspapers over the last week, Britons have voted for X. No, they haven't. I mean, you know, 52% of the people who went out voted for that. But that's not Britons or Britain. Okay? You've got to put faces on these people. You've got to understand who they are. You've got to think what power they have, what power they don't have, what they want, what they don't want. And I think to be, to be righteous, for want of a less pretentious phrase, you always need to be punching upwards, don't kick downwards. When you tell stories, when you tell stories for these purposes, you need to remember whose side you're on, or you need to decide whose side you're on, I guess. I'm not going to tell you which side. I'm sure you pretty much guessed which my side is by now. But again, so other things. You know, punch up, don't kick down. Think about power. Follow the money, follow the supply chain, and follow the sewer system, which is just the other, the other end of the supply chain. And I think most importantly, don't exploit ignorance. You can leverage ignorance. A lot of the skill of narrative is exactly in leveraging ignorance. But don't exploit it, leverage it to try and fix it. If you see that gap in someone's knowledge, don't see that as a marketing opportunity. See it as an opportunity to invent something, even if it's just a story. And most importantly, this must always be an iterative process. You need to create, then you need to look at what you've created and critique it. You need to go back and work on it again. And then you need to stop again and go back and critique it. And do that over and over and over again. We fiction writers say that stories are never finished. You simply reach a point where the editor won't give you a longer deadline. Okay? That's the way to treat it. Because you can always go back. You can always find things that you could do better. And how am I doing for time? Love and love day. Mm. <laughs> really? Christ. Well, I won't go into case studies in that case, but we'll see if we can't apply some of this stuff during the day. Thanks for your patience. I wish I'm, you know, I'm quite embarrassed to realise quite how long I've gone on. I hope it hasn't been too terribly awful and boring. Thanks for listening. <laughs>